Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in today's video, it's episode five of our GPZ build series. We're talking about the tail section. So this video, we're gonna do what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how, and the next one, we'll go through the how-to of modeling it. So if you wanna follow along with that, make sure that you subscribe and get notified when that video comes out. I will warn you that is going to be a very long video. It will probably be several hours. Modeling something like this with all of the fine details, making sure it's ready, takes some time. So just be aware of that. But in this video, we'll try to keep it short, 10 to 15 minutes at max, so we can talk about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how. Well, so the what's pretty straightforward, we're doing a tail section. Why we're doing it is because we're building a custom bike, and that is a large portion of the looks of a bike. So this bike from the 80s obviously looked quite a bit different back then. Um, the geometry, the attitude of the bike was rotated, so uh, the edge of the tank right here was actually pretty much horizontal or parallel to the ground. So that gives you kind of an idea of, of how much it shifted. Of course, it's on a rear stand right now, so it's a bit higher, but um, that already set the attitude or the, you know, the aggressiveness of the bike much differently. Um, it did have a full fairing at the time as well, but back in the 80s, the tail sections were pretty low and the wheel actually came up into them in most cases. So the undertails were really just space for the wheel to move up and down. As we got into the mid 90s, that trend sort of carried on, the tail sections got pretty big. And it wasn't until the late 90s when stuff like the first gen R1 came out and moving into the 2000s where we really started to see a slimming of these bikes, um, sort of mimicking MotoGP bikes of the era. So like the RC211V from Honda, um, a lot of the even two stroke GP bikes of that era were very minimalistic tails. And as I mentioned in the, the start of this series, the Attack YZF 750, which had its floating tail section, which I believe was a TZR 250 tail. That was a bike that just always stuck in my head. I love the look of basically no, no frame or structure there. When we do get to the exhaust, I'm planning on keeping the exhaust pretty low, keeping it looking pretty clean, maybe doing a dual exhaust, which I did have on this bike years ago. I had a dual sort of dump exhaust, it was very loud, so I need to do a better job of it this time. So the tail section, big part of the design, and I've built a lot of them. So over the years, I've built multiple tails. The first one I did was a version of the original. I actually took a spare original tail section and the metal grab rails and shortened it up. I took this um, and made sort of new side panels, built the whole thing out, and then I fiberglassed over it to build a mold. That tail was on the bike for quite a while. Um, when I rode it on the street back then, that tail section was on it. It's the tail section that was on it when it was in rapid bikes. And I liked the look of it, but it was never the exact tail that I wanted. It was just kind of what I could do at the time. I built multiple tails after that. Some of them came into reality. Some of them were just concepts that I ended up scrapping. Um, some of them went on to, to go on other bikes. There was one very minimal tail that I made that ended up on an old CB350 scrambler bike. Uh, so I just you know gave the parts away and somebody else used them. This version I originally built in 2010, uh, this, the sheet metal sort of base of what I was doing. This was meant to be a race bike at that time. So I had visions of doing a vintage series on the bike and the bike in stock form would be in what was considered vintage five. This, is, this would be the, you know, the 750 GPZ and, and kind of other bikes of that era would fall in there. Because of the suspension modifications going to 17 inch wheels, um, six piston brakes, and kind of all the other stuff that happened, it kicked it instantly up to vintage seven. And this is where like first gen R1s would be, CBR, you know, the CBR is from like the 919 and, and up to early CBR 1000s. So these are all these, you know, very powerful, fast, well handling leader bikes were in that class. From there, I realized that I was in the midst of doing a turbo kit. I had a intake that I built and I had um, built a first gen mega squirt microcontroller for it. Um, turbo kit, you know, turbo header and all that stuff. That would have completely kicked it out of vintage and it would have had to run in unlimited heavyweight class with modern leader bikes. 
And at that point, I was just like, I was just trying to do it for fun. It's not worth it. And I started um, building supermotos, doing a lot of track on supermotos. And this bike has just kind of sat since then. I'd always really wanted to finish a build, put it back on the street. It's a fun bike. It handles well. There are things that we need to sort out. But um, I think that with the technology that we have now, we can do a better job than what I was doing with all the hand-built stuff like this. So this was originally supposed to get body filler over it, smoothed out, and then turned into a mold for a fiberglass tail. It just kind of never got to that point. So then how are we doing it now? How are we going to do it different than I would have done it 15 years ago? Well, now we have 3D scanning, we have 3D printing, we have CAD tools that are accessible to hobbyists with the tools like Freeform Modeling and Fusion. So we're going to use that to our advantage. First things first, I use the Morocco 3D scanner. That's my go-to anytime I'm doing something in the garage. It's very portable, easy to use. Is it the best scanner for everything? No. I mean, every scanner has its pros and cons. Blue light scanners do a better job at like black shiny parts and it's an IR based scanner. So black and shiny parts, it doesn't do great at um, just kind of on its own. So with this, I ended up using scan spray around the tank, the, the vanishing, disappearing stuff from RevoPoint and sprayed a little bit on the subframe. The tail that's actually on the bike right now, that was one I modeled probably over a year ago on a suboptimal scan and it didn't fit. Uh, I mean, it's close, but you know, there are some potential problems. I tried to finesse it a bit. I, I made some modifications and I printed out just another front piece to test it out. And it was close, but it still wasn't perfect. So I definitely needed to spend more time with the scan. I wanted to get a, a good scan using near mode with the Morocco around the edge of the tank. So that way I had the mounting points, the lip, the shape. And then I used far mode for the rest of the stuff. And the goal was to capture the tank and subframe, and then also to capture the tank and the sheet metal tail. So the way that we do this is to scan everything, multiple scans, and then align or merge the tank subframe scan, and then take that and add in the tail section scan. So that way everything is aligned. We have a version of the scans which get turned into a mesh with the tank without the tail section and then one with the tank and the tail section. So this allows us to toggle on and off the tail section. And then when we go to align it, when we export this stuff, they'll all be aligned the same. So when we use quick surface, for example, to align our scans, we'll just make sure that both scans or both meshes move with it. Once we have that and make sure that it's aligned, the very least left and right, we want centered on the bike then we can go in and start designing. Now, obviously I'm using freeform modeling here. You could use surfaces if you wanted to. I think that freeform modeling is a much better tool set for something like this. And even though it does take a bit of time to get a, a finalized freeform model, it is worth it. Um, and it is still faster than surfacing in many cases. What we're gonna find is that this process, the video is gonna take probably a couple of hours um, simply because there are a lot of techniques that we need to understand. We build it out with very low face count first. We get the box shape to look right. And then we start adding the detail where we need it. We control the edges. We work on the flow of those edges, if they're disappearing or if they're moving. And what you're gonna find is that you have to spend a lot of time with those star points, with those um, end gons, the more than four sided or, let, or triangles and moving those around. So that way the final shape is nice and smooth. So we're gonna play around with all that and figure out how we can move them around, how we can control the edge flow. And then once we convert it to a solid, we'll add recesses and details for mounting to the tank and also some spaces for the future to mount to the subframe once I build sheet metal brackets and weld them on. So that way the tail will attach in three places, well, uh, three different places, the tank on the side, so it will be attached to the tank. The tank bolts to the subframe um, it's rubber isolated, so that's something that we do need to consider. And then the tail section will bolt to the subframe from the top and the bottom. And then I will likely make an extra piece or a bracket underneath because I have a scan of the subframe and a scan of the tail or the 3D model of the tail. We know exactly what that metal piece needs to look like. So that way the rider's weight is supported on metal directly on the subframe and not on the fiberglass or carbon fiber or 3D printed part. So throughout that process, once it's a solid and all those little details are added, we'll slice it up into different pieces 
add fasteners or add overlapping sections that we can glue together. Now I will give a shout out to Z's Garage. Uh, he was doing a, a CB build, he built a fairing that he reached out about and he's using a soldering iron or a plastic welder that has these little metal brackets that get pressed into the plastic. Now that's a great way to hold these 3D printed parts together. I really wanted to do it on this build, but because the tail section is solid, um, there's, there's not really any way to do that on this unless those pieces were on the outside. And I really didn't want that. So unfortunately I went with the epoxy route. It's not perfect, it's a bit messy, but again, for this concept, it worked. Now what I will say, one thing I would do differently is I would add little tabs like I did for the top and bottom, I would add them on the sides. I am 99% sure that this is not the final um, because we tend to make changes. Uh, as you'll see in the next episode, when we talk about the shock clamp, I ended up printing four of those and I made modifications three times until I was happy with the final design. This is the second full tail that I've printed. Um, so this is the first tail and I really liked the shape. The problem was that in this section here where it goes under the tank, it was too narrow and the subframe was hitting the bottom of it. I really liked it being narrow like that, but in the final version, um, you can see that it's a little bit taller. Uh, it's a little bit thicker in that area, not by much, but just enough so that the undertail can come forward further and that way it can tuck up under near where the shock clamp is and overall it just you know fits a little bit better. So this part um, is a much better fit than that one because I had a scan of the subframe, I had a scan of the mounting points on the tank so I actually do have a couple of screws that I'll put in and it'll actually attach it to, um, to, the, to the bike. And the recess that we built on the top goes down and it will touch, it's flat, and it'll be able to touch and support the rider. The ones from the bottom I'm not as worried about because that's just a mounting point. The one from the top is really the important one because the rider's weight really does need to be sitting on metal. And since this is not going to have a traditional seat, it's going to have foam, uh, like a race tail. I'm, I'm not going to do cross country riding on this bike. Um, I really just want to keep it as minimal as possible. So at the end of the day, the tools that we have like 3D scanning, 3D printing can really facilitate something like this. Even if we have to print it in multiple pieces and glue it or plastic weld it together, this technology and techniques like this are pretty far removed from having to go about it this way, which is laying out a bunch of lines on sheet metal, hitting it with hammers, using things like English wheels, leather bags, and ultimately either having a lot of tools that you can do a final sheet metal part or roughing it out like this and using body filler and spending a lot of time sanding and breathing in dust to build, to try to build out a final part. Now, obviously a sheet metal part like this is super heavy and it was never intended to be the final. I always meant to use it to build out a plastic part, um, whether it was uh, composite or carbon fiber or something like that. I never meant it to stay metal. All the tails that I built in the past were um, composite of some sort, fiberglass, but because of inaccuracies in the manufacturer process or my own skill or whatever it was, you know, they end up having body filler on them in areas and um, lots of paint, they just end up being quite a bit heavier. So this gives a lot of people or puts the technology and the skills in reach because now you can take 3D modeling skills and transition to 3D printing without having to really be proficient at things like sheet metal. Do I still think that there is a place for hand beating metal and making sheet metal parts? Absolutely. Making sheet metal parts is an important skill, especially if you're restoring cars or trying to restore metal parts. But in terms of building new parts like this, being able to CNC wood or foam or 3D print parts and build out fiberglass molds from that, um, it, it's just, it's a different world. So what's important to note is that once I'm happy with the final shape, what I will likely do is 3D print a negative of the left and right hand side. And that way I can build out the mold that way. Um, there's some, still some figuring out that has to happen to make that work because the tail is completely sealed. 
that means that it's going to be a bit tricky to lay composite like cloth or if it's um, you know carbon fiber you can't really lay it inside of there so you're going to have a seam somewhere so it may end up being split top and bottom or i may split it left and right that's how um, some tail sections like uh, the early srad gsxrs the tails were left and right and they were bolted together in the middle um, fzr 600s did that as well left right and there was a tail piece on the back I could go that route if I really wanted to, but it's just, there's still some thought that has to happen before I commit to doing that. So at this point, I think that this part of the build is done. Of course, we will circle back at the very end when we go to prep and paint and build out the composite parts, like the front fender, the tail section. The headlight is probably gonna stay 3D printed, but we still do need to prep it and paint it and stuff like that. So once, the rest of the mechanical parts and all the other things are done, then we'll come back and, and finalize those details. I'm still considering building a small fender and adding some riv nuts to the bracing on the swing arm and building a small fender there as well. I don't necessarily have to, but it's something I'm considering and I haven't decided yet. I'll just have to kind of look at the bike for a while to figure out if that's what I want to do. But that's gonna end this episode. Remember, if you wanna follow along with actually modeling the tail section, that'll be in the next episode we release. So if you wanna follow along and you don't wanna miss it, make sure that you subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one. <sighs> ah, yeah. So cozy.